Hey guys, good morning. This is Brother Randall. I am here to uh, start our Sunday morning Bible study. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to over to Acts chapter 9. We're going to be looking um, at the first, uh, looks like 16 verses maybe. Let me make sure, my, 19 verses of Acts chapter 9. It's going to be a familiar scripture to a lot of you if you've been in church. Um, it's Saul's conversion to Paul. It's the story of that. Um, and I want to tell you that this is not a uh, this is not a story for the sake of being a story. This is actually a historical event. And so sometimes when we read the Bible, we think it's just a story. It's kind of like Harry Potter or or whatever mythical book you want to read. But this is actual history. This is what happened. And the Bible is simply portraying what actually happened. So we need to keep that in mind as we look. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll start off. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving and giving to us. Lord, you're so good to us in every way. Open our hearts and our minds now this morning, Father, that we can see truth, know truth. Father, know you, and because you are truth. Help us, Lord, with wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, announce before we get started, on the 31st, Sunday the 31st, will be our first service back at church. Um, so we're excited about that. Uh, we're only going to have a Sunday morning service probably through the month of June, and then we'll reassess and see um, you know, how we can start adding other things in, what other things we want to add in or need to add in. Um, but we will start at 1045. Now, I will tell you, and you're gonna, you should um, uh, receive a notice by next Saturday that's going to have these instructions, but there are going to be some guidelines, obviously. We can't just come in and, and party down the aisles. We've got to still observe and do some things that we need to do. Um, the, and so when we get here, we're only going to enter through the front doors of the sanctuary. We're not going to come in any of the side doors at all, um, just so we can uh, control the flow of traffic. Um, the other thing is you will be required to have your temperature checked. Um, we will do that uh, in one of the rooms up, uh, in the front part of the church. Um, so to respect your privacy, it will be one family at a time, but you will be asked to stand outside. You'll come into the foyer, go into the room as a group, uh, come back out, and then go to your seat uh, in the sanctuary. Um, we will require that you wear a mask uh, at least through that process. Once you get seated in, in your spot, uh, then you can, you're free to take off your mask um, or to leave it on. That's, that's at your discretion. Now, we are going to have a section... The side section of the church over closest to the piano is going to be a section for people who are going to keep their mask on um, the entire process. Uh, and so we're going to reserve that particular section um, for people who are going to keep their mask on the entire process. And then the other two sections will be obviously opened up for people who um, are going to take their mask off. And we'll adjust that if we see more people want to keep their mask on the whole time, then we'll make adjustments to make sure everyone can get in. Um, but we're excited about that. So be praying about it uh, and be praying for the Spirit of God to move because I don't want us to be so conscious of six feet and so conscious of COVID that coming to church is a waste of time. Um, and so uh, so be praying about that even now and looking forward to it on the 31st. Um, so I'm looking at uh, Saul's conversion. Um, what we've been looking at, or we started a new chapter uh, last week, and, and that was actually looking at Jesus' life, and we, we looked at, now we're on mission, so understand that Jesus came for a mission, and that mission was to die. That mission was actually to suffer and sacrifice and die, and that's not often what we want to hear what we want to hear when we're signing up for Christianity, but Jesus Christ came to die. He is our model, and so we have to be willing to go to whatever length our model goes to. And, and so last week we looked at um, examples of Jesus' uh, suffering and dying and uh, his loneliness, the things that he went through, uh, and then of his sacrifice. And so we looked at those in regards to him. Now this morning I want to look at what that looks like as it's playing out in Saul's life. Remember Saul is on the fast track in the Jewish faith to becoming a, a great man. He's already a, a great man, but he's he's becoming a really powerful man. Uh, he's just uh, sat and, and uh, watched uh, Stephen be executed. Um, he's on a mission. He's, he's passionate. His word is zealous. Um, he's zealous to stop this Christian movement at whatever cost. He sees it as heresy. Um, I mean, he really is the go-to man. He's the hit guy for the Jewish faith, and, and he's going after Christianity 
with a vengeance. And so um, when we get to chapter 9 of the book of Acts, we, we, we see, um, you know, we ended up, uh, let's see, with uh, Philip in the, in the eunuch. And, and now we're, we're looking at Paul, or actually Saul. He's going to be Paul. So beginning in verse 1, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way. That's Christians. Uh, he found there. Uh, he wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So, so when, we, when we start off with this, we, we're looking at who Saul really is. This is his heart. Now, understand, don't, don't get a rock and throw it at him because there's been a paradigm change in uh, what God is doing from uh, using the Jews to be his mechanism of evangelism that they did not embrace Messiah. In fact, they crucified Messiah. So now God is, is ushering in a new era, and that new era is the church. And so, um, so you know, but everybody didn't get the memo. And so, you know, and it would be very hard. Paul is a Jew of Jews. All he's known is the Jewish faith. And so when he sees people coming in, and obviously um, with this new idea, Messiah hasn't come. Messiah couldn't have come. Mm -hmm. Um, because he would know. And so um, and so you have to understand it from his point of view. So P Saul is, is on a vengeance here. I mean, he is eager to kill the Lord's followers. That's, that's pretty radical. And, uh, and he's being sanctioned um, by the high priest. And so, you know, he, he, he knows he can't go off and do it on his own. So he has to get a letter. So he gets letters um, he's going to start in Damascus or in the synagogues of Damascus, and he's just going to work his way around. And so he asked for um, the, that they would get letter addresses of people who are Christians, followers of the way, um, because he wanted to bring them back. And, and in no, no uncertain terms, he wanted to bring them back in chains. He was going to make a public spectacle because in his mind, if he could publicly humiliate and publicly assassinate or um, execute these these Christians that that would squash the movement and and that's his goal he wants to squash this movement so so that's his motive that's letters in hand on his way to Damascus and um, as he's approaching verse three says as he's approaching Damascus on this mission all right so you understand that Paul or Saul here is on a mission. He, um, the missions that we're talking about are, are not just doing our own thing. This is a mission that he believes is ordained by God. He's gotten the, the okay from the high priest. And so he believes he's doing God's thing here. And, um, and so he's on mission. The, the problem is he's just on the wrong mission. And so, so he's on mission. You can be on mission with a very, very sincere heart and still be on the wrong mission. You can, you can be zealous. You can be passionate. You can be all the right things and still be on the wrong mission. And that's exactly where Paul is. He's on a mission here, but it's the, it's the wrong mission. And he's about to have a salvation encounter. And so um, as he's approaching, um, a light from heaven suddenly shone around him. Verse 4, he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, that's an interesting um, line there. That's an interesting use of words there because Saul is not persecuting God. Saul is persecuting Christians. But remember, now Christians are the body of Christ. Now, Paul has no concept of that. I mean, so not beating him up. We do. We have a concept. We understand that when, when God says, why are you persecuting me? Um, you know, that is the furthest thing from, from um, Paul's heart or Saul's heart. He's not wanting to persecute God. He's wanting to persecute Christians. And he doesn't understand that the followers of the way are God's body, are the body of Christ. And so, but Paul doesn't understand that or Saul doesn't. He says, why are you person? And then, and, then, um, and then Paul says, or Saul says, well, who are you, Lord? 
obviously as a voice that he hears, there's this tremendous light. And so he says, well, who are you, Lord? And, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Wow, that had to be a mind bomb for Saul. Because all this time, Saul has believed that Jesus was a heretic and, and a, a crazy rabbi that went radical and went, was making crazy claims that he was Messiah. And he had these crazy people around him, these nobodies around him. He even dealt with tax collectors and, and um, uh, publicans, people like, he's just, that couldn't be Messiah. And now here's that Jesus speaking to him. I mean, he's, he's having a, an experience with him. And, and, he, and Jesus says, uh, why are you persecuting me? Paul says, well, who are you? And Jesus says, I'm Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Wow. Man, that's, that's deep. I mean, you need to spend a little time just thinking on, on that because I want to tell you, when you're anti-God's people, you're anti-God. You know, I, I understand the church is messed up. We are a messed up group of people. We all have our own hangups. We all have our own baggage. We all have all this stuff going on. We are a motley crew of people, but we are still the body of Christ. And when you persecute the church, you are literally persecuting Christ. And, and, and so you just need to understand that even from a Christian point of view, non-Christians, people who don't believe, it's, it's really not going to mean that much to them. But for Christians, I just want you to understand every time you badmouth the church, and when I say the church, I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about the people. Every time you talk against your brother and sister, every time you say, man, I don't go to church a bunch of hypocrites, whatever, I just want you to understand you're talking about the body of Christ, so be careful about that. You say, well, I don't mean it toward Jesus. I mean it toward those people, but I want to tell you, those people are his body. I, you, if you're a Christian, are his body. And when we speak against each other, we are speaking literally against Christ. And so you just need to be very careful how and what you say about the church and, and make sure that what you say is from a pure heart and pure motive. Jesus then, this is crazy to me because Paul has no experience with Jesus. Saul has no experience with Jesus. And look at verse six, because it's like, what, did I miss something? <laughs> Have I stepped into a time warp here or what's happening? Now get up and go to the city and you'll be told what you must do. Well, I just learned your name. And I, 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 I thought you were crazy. And now you're giving me instructions. Verse seven, the men of Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they didn't see anybody. So they heard the voice. It isn't just Saul hearing voices in his head. The, these people that are with Saul heard the voice, but they saw nobody. And um, look, at, look at verse 8. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. Well, I would submit to you that he was probably more blind before this event ever happened. So this is the beginning of him seeing, but he's blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days. That's, that's interesting all in itself. But he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Verse 9, now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. So, so I want to I show you something here about mission. Paul was on his own mission, what he genuinely believed was the right mission. Jesus has intervened and, and, and asked him a question and then put him on another mission. Now, what is that mission? That mission is to go to the city and wait until somebody tells you what you're supposed to be told. That's, that's Paul's mission. Sometimes we think missions are these great, elaborate, huge things. And literally, the mission is simply to follow the voice of God, no matter what the voice of God tells you to do. Just follow that. The voice of God tells you to go hang upside down. One of the prophets was, to, was told to walk around naked as an example. That's pretty, uh, you don't want that. You don't, do not want God to tell me that. Um, uh, but but 
I mean, you have to, it, a mission is simply listening to the voice of God, being able to hear the voice of God, and then doing what that, that voice says, not above or below it. And so his, his simple mission was this, um, get up and go to the city and wait until someone comes to tell you what to do. That's, that's Paul's mission. So that's what he did, blind. Stayed there three days, didn't eat or drink. Um, doesn't say that God told him to do that. That's just what he chose to do. And there's a lot of thoughts behind that. You can go study that yourself. Um, now, there was a believer in Damascus. So, so by the word believer there, you understand that this is a Christian. This is a follower of the way. This is someone that can hear the voice of God without being struck down by lightning. And someone who God has full authority through uh, because he's been bought by Jesus Christ, full authority to say, um, you know, go do what I want you to do. So, um, so this is what happens. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. And Ananias said, yes, Lord. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I saw him, uh, I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. Now, now there is Ananias' um, mission. That's the, God has, has, has put, purposed this in his heart, and he's very specific. I mean, I, I don't think that I've ever gotten direction this specific before. Well, I, I know I haven't. Um, but Ananias gets very specific direction here, and it's to go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas, and there's a man now. Now listen, none of that would have bothered Ananias, I don't think. Now, I don't know the neighborhood, so maybe it's a bad neighborhood. I don't know that part. But when he heard a man from Tarsus named Saul, I bet that, I bet that got his attention, and we're going to see that it did. So, so when, you, when you hear the first part, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas, might not have, okay, yeah, yeah, maybe he's got me a, a, a love offering or something. But then it says, when you get there, look for a man named Saul of Tarsus. He's praying right now, and I've shown him a vision that you're coming to lay hands on him so he can see again. Now, I, I don't know Ananias, so I don't want I don't, I don't to presume here, but I'm going to make a speculation, which are dangerous, Make a speculation here that it's not every day that Ananias lays hands on people and they can see. So do you see several problems with his mission? I mean, I, I can. Don't know what part of town it is. Um, so I can't speak to that, but I do know that he would have known who Saul of Tarsus is. And I do know uh, that it's probably not an everyday occurrence that he goes and lays hands on people and they can see again. So, so we've got some. We've got an impossibility here. We're going over to perhaps a person's house I don't know, and we're going to lay hands on a person that I do know wants to lay hands on me, and not in a good way. And so, so there, there is his mission. God doesn't ask his permission. God doesn't say, "I'm going to tell you something," and, and I'm going to tell you something about um, Saul that I that I didn't mention. You don't see Jesus begging him to do it. You don't see it, hear him saying, please. Oh, come on. You know, I, I, want, I want you to know that Jesus waylays him and asks him why he's persecuted, and then he gives him the mission. And there's no room for dialogue there. And we want dialogue. We think that God owes us dialogue. God owes us, well, you got to spell it out for me, God. You got to take care of my needs. I got to do la la la. And you, you know, you know, I can't do that because I don't know that part of the town. I can't do that because I can't go to a strange person. I'm not good at speaking. I don't. I've never been able to lay hands on people and then be able to see it. I sure don't want to talk to Saul of Tarsus. It's the last person I want to see. I mean, you, there's just all kind of problems there. But I want you to understand that God isn't asking you. He is commanding you. We, we, we sometimes get that wrong, and it's hard for us Americans to understand that because we're not used to being commanded. Um, but, but he's not asking, and he's not begging. I think sometimes people want to be begged, and we're bad about begging. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I, I made a promise to myself um, 
this year, my big, hairy, audacious goals was I'd never beg anybody else to serve God. You either do or you don't. If you won't do it for him, you sure ain't going to do it for me. And and I'm not going to beg you to do it. I never see one place in the Bible where Jesus begged people to follow him, where Jesus begged people um, to do the right thing. He, he, he told them what the right thing was, and it broke his heart when they didn't do the right thing, but he didn't beg them. And so I see Ananias here. Uh, God isn't asking him this. He's telling him to do this. And uh, and so, but look at verse 13, because Ananias is, is truly, God, I love the fact that God doesn't cover up our struggles. And I exclaims, but Lord, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem. So, so Ananias, when he heard Tar- Tarsus, a man named Saul, is under no delusions here. He, he, it's secondhand information, but it's credible. And, and he's afraid here. And, and he, rightly so. This man has been killing people. Uh, namely, we know for a fact, Stephen. And so Ananias says, okay, and he's authorized by the leading priest to arrest anyone who calls on your name. So not only does he know who he is, but he knows, you know how you know how news is, people haven't changed. He knows that uh, they are, um, the news has already traveled because it's beaten Paul in his mission, initial mission. And, and so, you know, they know why he's coming. And, and, and he's, he's afraid, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord. And this is what the Lord says. He doesn't say, please. You know, and I know, I know some of you are more, some of us are more sensitive than others. And obviously we want to be, gracious and gentle and faith, you know, we want to do those things. But I just want to tell you, that's not God's method. I mean, he simply is just going to move on to somebody else. Yeah, okay, Ananias, I mean, he knows Ananias is going to do it because God knows everything. But let's say Ananias isn't going to do us. And who knows how many people God had in mind to bless with this great opportunity, but he knew they wouldn't do it. And I often think about that with us. I wonder how many, with me, I wonder how many opportunities I've missed, the great opportunities to make such a difference. How many people could I go and lay hands on and they they could see? Um, or how many people do you get to be a part of the greatest writer, arguably, in the New Testament? I mean, how many people get to be a part of seeing that guy come to life? I mean, and so I wonder how many people could have had that God knew Ananias would. Even though he's questioning here, he's a human. And so he's questioning. But God doesn't beg. Go, he says, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as the people of Israel. So there is Paul's one, two, three. Saul at this point, but Paul, one, two, three. He's called to take his message to the Gentiles to kings and to the people of Israel. So that's Paul's, Ananias knows Paul's calling before Paul knows Paul's calling because God has shared it with him here. And and God says, listen, he's my chosen servant. Doesn't matter what you think about him. It, It doesn't matter what you've heard. Doesn't matter what you think his intentions are. I'm telling you, he's mine. Go do what I'm telling you to do. And then he says, uh, and I will show him how much he must, and look at this line, suffer for my name's sake. Isn't that a weird line? I mean, it's, it's certainly a weird line to say to Ananias, but, you know, on the forefront, I mean, God knows everything, obviously. He knows the, the full-time schedule, so, but he's going to show Paul how much he must suffer. So, so in my mind, I mean, I, I did some reading, but in my mind, you know, God in his calling of Saul shared with him on the forefront, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. Now, you know, we have scriptures in the Bible says, you know, when you suffer, when trials come, when those things come. So we, we understand, but, but, um, but, but Jesus is saying to Ananias here, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer 
for my name's sake in advance. And the really crazy thing is Saul, Paul, still did it. He stayed on mission. Wow. So Ananias did what he was supposed to do. He went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and he said, now look at these words because these are crucial. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Just an act of obedience. Now, I want you to understand that Ananias doesn't have this kind of power. I don't know if it ever happened again. I've told you many, many times the story where Brother Buford prophesied and um, about uh, the little girl not having leukemia. Never heard him do it again. And I heard him pray for people many, many times, say, Lord, if it's your will. Never. Now, I didn't know him his entire ministry. I knew him all the way up to the end of his ministry, but I didn't know his entire ministry. I didn't know when he was a younger minister. Um, so, so I don't know if he ever made that statement before. I don't know that I ever asked him. If I did, that brain cell's dead. I don't remember. Um, but I, kn I know for a fact, I never heard him say that again. And, and I have to believe in, in Ananias' life here that, you know, he probably never touched someone and they regained eyesight again. This was a one, this was a one-timer. And, and man, what a, what a, what an awesome thing. And he could have missed it if he hadn't been on mission, if he hadn't been willing to step beyond the box and step beyond his own fear and, and just go for it and just say, you know, God, God's got me. I don't, I don't know how this is, but God's got me. But, but Ananias did. And he did exactly what God, and look at, look at the compassion that he, he, he handles himself. I mean, just by the fact he calls him Brother Saul, um, you know, he knows what kind of man this is. And he knows, but he calls him Brother Saul, the Lord who appeared to you on the road has sent me. And, and, and man, what a, what a blessing. Look at verse 18, because it's, it's crazy. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized. Afterwards, he ate some food and regained his strength. So, so I'm looking at these two missions uh, in light of, of what um, we learned about Jesus in uh, his uh, loneliness and in his suffering um, persecution and uh, in his, I'm looking for the word, in his sacrifice. And we see um, that God has told Paul, Saul, on the forefront, you're going to suffer. <laughs> it's going to be tough. And look at Ananias. He was willing to suffer because while while we know the rest of the story, I don't know how far it was over to Straight Street from Ananias' house to Judas's house. I have no idea how far that was. But I can tell you this, it was a long walk for Ananias. Because even though God has told you to do something, you're still a human. And you're, you're still capable of frailty, of fear, of failure. All of us are. We're, none of us are immune just when we take our eyes off Jesus, we, we, we sing just like Peter did. And so this had to be a long walk for Ananias and he's counting the cost, you know, of should I, I wonder how many times Satan or his demons told Ananias to turn around. You can't, you can't go there, man. Are you crazy? First of all, you, you, this guy kills people. Second of all, you don't have no power of healing. You, you can't heal somebody that's, that's, uh, that is blind. You, you can't do that. I mean, how many times does he try to get you off mission? Uh, presuming you know your mission, how many times do you start to do whatever it is that God has told you to do and Satan is right there telling you you can't do that? And, and he is absolutely right. But I can do all things through Christ. 
I mean, he's absolutely right. He's telling a partial truth. I can't do it. I don't have the power to restore someone's sight. I don't have the power to get rid of COVID. I don't have the power um, to, to do. And I have a tendency to be afraid, as many of you do. So, so there's, there's, there's a probability of suffering and death for Ananias. And yet he gets there in his mission. He fulfills the mission. Now, I don't know if this was his last mission. I'm going to presume not. It's the one we know. But I assume that God gave him other missions. That wasn't his only one, but that's the one we see. And, and uh, you know, he didn't say go get 20 of your fellow folks in case Saul changes his mind. Uh, he, he walked that path alone. And he went and handled it with such graciousness. I, I just want to encourage you in your ministry, in your mission, that there may very well be suffering. There may very well be fear. But God's got you. If you die in the process, God still got you. And I, th I think we hold on to this life as if this is the end of everything. And if, if, if something happens here, it's over with. But I just want to tell you, this is not the end. Christians, we have hope. And that hope leads us to not care for our lives, but to do whatever God tells us to do. Not foolishly, not stupidly. We don't just randomly go stupid, do stupid things. But this guy didn't just wake up one morning and say, hey, I think Saul's in town. I'm going to go try to get those scales off his eyes and uh, maybe I can call him brother and he'll be nice to me. No, he went on the mission that God sent him on. I just want to remind you, you can't go on any mission and have the power of God. You can do anything you want. But to have the power of God, you must be on God's mission and you must complete that mission the way God leads you to. Now, these men did not have the Bible. We have the Bible. So much of what you need to do is already recorded in the Bible. You say, well, God hasn't spoken to me and told me how to do my mission. I bet he has. I, I guarantee you there is a lot of what we're all supposed to be doing. All of our missions have some things in common. And what we're all supposed to be doing is already written in the Bible. But I heard Glenn say it this week um, on Friday's Fast 15 um, that, that oftentimes we don't know what the Bible says. And so we, we or, or we know what it says, but we don't do it. So we don't, we don't apply the wisdom to do it. So it's pointless. And I just want to tell you, you don't get any mission you want. You can't do it any way you want. You've got to follow the instructions of God you got to have a gracious heart. And, and with Saul, you know, he, his eyes are open, but he's going to go into this ministry um, eyes wide open. And that's crazy to me. I mean, that, that, that line where Jesus said, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. That's a crazy line. And it, it just gives me greater respect for Paul because he went into that eyes wide open. He didn't go into that thinking, oh, wow, everybody's going to love me and I'm going to be, you know, I was on the fast train to being somebody in this and I'm going to be a high, high dude in this. And, and But Jesus is saying, no, I, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer. So I just want you to have the right perspective of mission. It's not, uh, it is for everyone, but not everyone will accept it because some people are, are, uh, are too afraid. They're going to miss the opportunity. They're not going to go on mission. Um, they're always just going to stay in that same rut that they've always been. Even Christians miss some of the greatest blessings of their life because they won't go on mission. They won't, Or they go on mission, but they don't go on God's mission. Or they go on God's mission, but they don't do it the way God told them to do it. And so it's, it's just a vicious cycle, and they get so frustrated and they get so angry. And I know that pain because I've done it myself many, many times, sadly. And what we've just got to decide to do is listen for the voice of God and wait till we know the voice of God. Stop running over to Judas's house when God hadn't told you to go. I mean, notice God didn't tell everybody to go to Judas's house. He only told Ananias to do that. What if everybody in the community, hey, let's go see if we can convert Saul. He's come to kill us, but maybe we can convert him. That'd be a good thing. Yeah, let's go do that. Well, God is the one that sends us on mission, not us. And so I just want us in, in, in this lesson to reevaluate the missions we are on 
to see if they're actually ones that God sent us on, and then to open our ears and our hearts to what mission God actually might be trying to send us on that we're trying to manipulate. Um, I, God's got great things, and I'm looking for great things. Don't miss it in the scripture. Love you guys. Look forward to seeing you at 1045. Have a great day.